Uh, good afternoon from uh, very steamy Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, welcome to Ridge Vineyard's weekly winemakers roundtable. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come and taste some wines with us. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping points before we get going. Uh, the Q&A function is live and let's, we'd like to use that for questions for our production team. So feel free to put through your questions through the Q&A. We'll try to answer as many of those questions live with our team as possible. We'll also have some team members from Ridge uh, on the Q&A uh, function answering questions there. So one way or another, we'll definitely answer your questions. The chat function is all, also live. I see some of you are already using it. Feel free to check in, let us know what you're tasting, where you're at. Um, whatever you'd like to share, the chat function is there for you. So today's topic is Chardonnay, which of course is a bit unusual and most, a lot of people don't even realize Ridge makes white wine, let alone Chardonnay. But today we're going to focus on uh, a wine that we've actually made from the very beginning, since 1962, the year that Ridge was bonded as a winery, we made Chardonnay. We've made Chardonnay every year since. Uh, that first Chardonnay was made from vines grown on Montebello Ridge uh, that were planted in the late 1940s. Uh, since then, we've planted more Chardonnay on the, uh, on the estate. Um, from the beginning and the early days, we were producing less than 10 barrels and essentially all of it was sold through our tasting room. But today we have we're produced a little bit more and it gets out a little bit more, but not a lot. Uh, it still represents uh, much less than 5% of our total production. Uh, so, so that'll be our focus today. And with the 82 degrees in the house today, I'm glad we're tasting white wines, not red wines, to be honest yeah. with you. <laughs> Uh, so the three wines we're going to try today in tasting order are the 2018 Estate Chardonnay will be first, followed by the 2017 Montebello Chardonnay, and then we pulled something out of the library, the 2010 Montebello Chardonnay. All these wines are still available for sale on our website. There's uh, about two cases left at the 2010 Montebello Chardonnay, just a, a little bit left, but all three wines as of this moment are still available. So let me introduce our panel uh, so we can get to tasting the wines. Uh, first, uh, in my upper left-hand corner is David Gates. David is our Senior Vice President of Vineyard Operations and has been with Ridge since 1989. In the upper right-hand corner, in the Lazy Boy, is John Olney. <laughs> uh, John's our COO and winemaker at Lytton Springs and has been with Ridge since 1996. And uh, in my bottom left-hand corner with the world's largest paperweight is Eric Barr. <laughs> Hi. And, uh, Eric uh, is our COO and winemaker at Lytton Springs and is, excuse me, at Montebello and has been with yeah. Ridge since 1994. So welcome to you all, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today. Looking forward to working through these wines. Um, so before we start tasting, Eric, maybe, you know, we're tasting an estate Chardonnay and a Montebello Chardonnay. Let's talk about how we distinguish between the two wines and what, what makes one and what makes the other wine. Yeah, yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, the key difference really is the style of the two wines. I mean, the estate uh, Chardonnay, what we used to call Santa Cruz Mountains in the earlier days, was really all about fruit, having good fruit focus, um, really beautiful drinkability, you know, peel. So that you could drink the Chardonnay and enjoy it over like a, a one to you know, 10 year period of time. Montebello in the years that we've made it, what we're looking for is, is a great vineyard imprint in the wine, the limestone, uh, higher acid, more, more weight and, and structure to it. You know, there's no tannin involved in this wine, but there's still, there's a grip to the wine when it's young and and as it ages, it really just kind of helps carry the wine and it can go on for many decades in, in the bottle. And so, you know, we're, we're looking for that in the cellar. We never really know specifically for each vintage if we're going to make a Montebello. It's really as the wines are fermenting and as it evolves in the cellar, as we're doing the surly aging that I'm tasting and, and I'm trying to find those particular barrels that have really captured that great um, Montebello character. And then we have to see how well they blend together. So when we actually do produce it and bottle it, it it's 
it can be a, a good amount or a very small amount. So like this uh, 2017 that we're having that I bottled last uh, a year ago, um, that's only 197 cases. You know, so a tiny, tiny production from a really great vintage, but you know, probably the most I've ever made was a 13 vintage where, yeah. you know, 50% of the fruit that came in, I mean, it just produced such beautiful quality that I was able to make close to, I think, 1600 cases. Um, but it, but it varies year to year. Some years we won't even make it if I don't find it in the cellar. Um, but, but we do try to produce it. And, and you know, the, the vineyard that we have today, having planted in a couple more spots on the mountain, we actually have more diversity. So we can actually find in any kind of growing condition of that year, a spot somewhere on the mountain that's going to give us the Montebello character. Yeah. So David Gates, I mean, yeah, you're our farmer. We grow Cabernet, Merlot, Petit Bordeaux, other, you know, the Bordeaux varieties on the Montebello Ridge on the estate, but we also grow the Chardonnay. So how, what is different about growing Chardonnay versus the Bordeaux varieties? And, and where do we plant the Chardonnay versus the, the Bordeaux varieties? So the, most of our Chardonnay is, is grown kind of a little bit lower down on the mountain um, in, in the, uh, kind of right in the middle of the inversion layer. So we've talked about that inversion layer. It's really what is our saving grace here on that and our limestone soil. So the, the Bay Area, the, the south part of the Bay Area is a great big heat sink. And so as that heat um, rises up from the valley, it draws in all this beautiful cold air from the, through the San Francisco uh, Golden Gate and over the pass um, from Half Moon Bay. And along with that air is often fog. So the fog kind of lays in and, and makes for very nice, comfortable sleeping weather down in the valley. So it's hot in the day, cooler at night. Well, that fog kind of sits at what we call the inversion layer where um, it'll top out at about, oh, between 1,400 and 1,700 feet plus or minus. And so most of the, the blocks at Klein, um, about 18 acres of Chardonnay at Klein is all in that, right in that inversion layer. We have a little bit of Chardonnay, as, as Eric alluded to, that's at the Rooston Ranch, a little bit up on the hill. And that sits, um, the Chardonnay there is about a little over 1,800 feet in elevation. And that sometimes gets it, sometimes doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, we have a little bit planted all the way up at Peroni, so way up on top. Mm -hmm. And um, when that sets, uh, the, I think the fruit can be really well because it's cooler there in the spring. It's much warmer at night, but cooler during the day. And so, and just like with Cabernet, that promotes ripening at lower sugars, we think it'll do the same thing with our Chardonnay mm -hmm. there. Yeah. David, how do we uh, determine when to pick the Chardonnay? Uh, these three vintages uh, were all very different. So one was picked at the end of August. The other didn't finish pick till the middle of October. Three very different vintages. How, how do we go about determining the right time to pick? Yeah, so it's, it's a lot of, a lot of it is flavor, but you also have to really watch numbers. So the majority of our Chardonnay is a, is a, a clone that is um, you, kind of ubiquitous in California. It, and what, it, one of its hallmarks is high acid. It retains very good acidity, which is a little bit exacerbated here because of the climate or Santa Cruz Mountains climate and the limestone soils that, that it's planted in. Um, the other thing it does is accumulate sugar very quickly. So we're really conscious of how the, how the flavors are developing. So we, there is a green note to Chardonnay if you pick it too soon. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so much acid in the grapes that it hides the sugar when you're sampling. So you really have to look at the analysis and see, see what, the, what the sugar levels are uh, rising to. And um, Eric can talk about how more efficient the yeast have been getting in the last <laughs> yeah oh um, yeah but, they've acclimated to sugar yeah. fermenting efficiently yeah yeah and not just for chardonnay for uh, reds too but pretty much but, everything yeah yeah so so it's it's tricky because when you're tasting especially there there was a block that is actually it's now cabernet we butted it over that was um an older clone of chardonnay that was very high in malic acid and and because we go through malolactic fermentation, when we picked that grape, the grapes for that, we always thought it was it had plenty of sugar, but it had all this acid. So you thought it's not ready to pick, and yet it goes through malolactic and it makes this beautiful wine. And so you yeah, really buttery, super yes. soft, flat. 
I used to yeah. call that block. It was kind of like the Central Coast Chardonnay, like Santa <laughs> Barbara, it. really melon and, you know, really flabby. <laughs> yeah, little, little goes a long way. Yeah, and that's kind of why we took it out or converted it over to Cab because it, it just was always high malate and it really made the most unusual wine uh, of all the parcels we had to select from. So John, with you, when you're tasting the 18 Chardonnay, and maybe you would compare and contrast what you're tasting in this wine versus maybe a prototypical Valley N Napa Chardonnay uh, in this sort of, sort of, you know, from a, from a taste profile, what are the differences you're seeing between, between the two, two such wines? Um, I, to me, I think uh, the biggest difference is I mean, first you get it in the aroma. Um, what I always, one of the hallmarks for me for uh, Montebello or, or, the, or the estate, but our Chardonnay is this, this citrus element to the, to the fruit so that it's not all fruit. It's not just this pure kind of ripe apple, pineapple um, that, that comes at you. Um, and it also, when you get to the palate, like David mentioned, you have that acidity, which to me makes it more precise, and also the minerality. So all of those things, to me, makes it, a, it so to speak, kind of a, a tighter package that's more focused, as opposed to something that's kind of heavy and, I don't want to say cloying, but, you know, it, 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 mm -hmm. it, becomes, it becomes very... Um, uh, you know, when you get to the second or third glass, you're not really going back and looking for different things to develop and more to come out. It's kind of the same and the same and the same. Yeah. So Eric, it, th this is always the interesting challenge that we're able to thread the needle on this. It, you know, our Chardonnays are in a lot of ways full throttle. They're barrel fermented, 100% mm -hmm. Malo. We're adding a lot of richness to the wine. So, you know, how are we able to do all of that but still keep the wines bright and interesting and, and fresh. I think it all begins with the picking date. I mean, being really on top of the harvest, getting the fruit off the vine before the sugars shoot through the roof. And, you know, it's that overripeness that we have had occasionally in some past vintages, like in the early 2000s, that just made the wine really unctuous and rich and, you know, still precise with acidity, but they were, they were heavy. I, I'm more drawn to this style that's balanced, um, you know, fresher, it's got the citrus, uh, you get more minerality, you can really taste the place, the, the soil and the character of the site. And, and, you know, compared to the Montebello 18, which we just literally bottled like a, lot, a couple weeks ago, you, you see just how this wine is immediately so much more accessible, you can read the fruit, you can taste it. It flows across the palate really elegantly. There's, there's no, no hard edges to it. Whereas the Montebello definitely has, has firmer acid and a, a real grip to it. And, and that will change as that wine ages out and bottle, um, whereas this is just so delicious right now and really in the style that I'm, I'm drawn to and the style that we've really been known for making here. Eric, can you talk a little bit about that and the evolution of American oak and French oak in our Chardonnay? Because more, yeah. than any other, more than any other wine, I think, in our portfolio, that we sort of bounced back and forth and moved around about the use and of French oak versus American oak and the amount of new oak we're using. That's all sort of evolved a lot over time. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, evolution? it really has. And so that's kind of why I grabbed this extra bottle out of the cellar here, something you know, back in the day, 1990, a lot of French oak. And basically that was all that was used in the Chardonnay cellar to barrel ferment in. And it usually was a pretty healthy amount of new French oak coming in from Tonel la Rue Rouge and Francois Frere. And so, you know, as I joined in 94, we were still with that same formula, you know, and, and part of that is just the aromatics of French oak, so beautiful. Um, our best red wine barrel makers really didn't make burgundy barrels that were had the finesse to go with our mountain chardonnay so it wasn't until 96 that we actually began working with our first set of of french or american oak burgundy barrels coming from kentucky and trial we trialed them against the french 
And in Blind Tasting saw that they were really neck and neck and, and really integrating the oak nicely. And so with that, we just continued to move more in that direction of American oak. And so really by the early 2000s, we became much more dominant American oak in the cellar. And, and as we saw how American oak was working with the wine, we really saw that, that it was crucial to start taking the amount of new oak down. So when we buy barrels today, we're usually looking at somewhere around 10 to 15% new oak in the cellar. And we'll actually hold on to those barrels for as long as 10 years. So as, as we're in harvest and we're bringing in the parcels from the vineyard, pressing, barreling down the juice, we send that juice across the wide range of, of different age oak so that we get the right proportion of oak for each cube. And as we assemble, then we're really making sure that the overall wine has good oak integration. So like this 18, I, I think we're somewhere around 10% new oak total, but most of it is older neutral. And, and actually once the wine is assembled, we actually do this extended aging period where the wine is, is resting only in the oldest barrels for about five additional months after assemblage. And it's during that time of resting in neutral oak that whatever new oak came in at assemblage begins to integrate. And that's then when we draw off and, and bottle the wine so that it really is finished off in those older barrels where it gives the wine a chance to really integrate nicely all that the oak components because we really don't want to make this wine of, of the barrel. We want to make it so that it, it tastes correct uh, for the variety and for the vineyard character. So David, I have some, a, a geeky soil question for you. You bet. So, uh, so our limestone, that's a, it's a marine derived soil there. That's a, a fossilized coral reef. The greenstone that lays on top of the limestone, is, is that also a marine soil? Or in, where does that come from and, and what, how does that add to the flavors of the wine? Yeah, so, so our limestone, it's, it's actually um, was formed from, a, from like a volcanic vent. Yeah, sea vent. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it, it, Geothermal are, activity. Yep, there are no, uh, no fossils in it. So typically limestone is definitely, um, you'd see, you would see um, limestone laid down when the water was shallow. If it got too deep, um, then you would have, you just have sediment, which could be a mudstone. This particular greenstone is also from those thermal vents. It's just that it spit out this magnesium um, derived sandy uh, rock instead of, um, instead of the limestone. The other thing to remember, these are very old soils. They're like 140 million years old where the limestone that you see in, um, in say in, in parts of, let's say in, in uh, parts of Burgundy and in uh, Paso Robles, or they're more like 40 million years old or tw 20 to 40 million years old. So lots of sea life, lots of mammals, uh, bones in, in, in there. Um, this, this limestone, because it's that old, it's had a lot of pressure and forces on it. So it's all kind of mushed together and smashed up. It's called a melange. And they're Within that is the limestone, the greenstone. There's also some volcanics because we are right on the San Andreas Fault and things have, have um, messed up, <laughs> mixed <laughs> up and messed up everything. And, and the other thing that you see is some other just kind of sedimentary soil that's either from the North American plate or more recently from the Pacific plate because we're right where those two plate, plates meet. So it's, it's complicated. It is. But, uh, but the short answer is that, yeah, the greenstone is also fr from the same source as the limestone then. It is yeah, also sorry, I got, I got- No, it's all right. That's it's, all right. <laughs> I, I, and, it's and my it's job just, to summarize, David, is here's up to pontificate, so it's yeah, all right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so one more question for you, David, about global warming and the effect of Chardonnay, on Chardonnay at Montebello in particular. Do you, how do you see that playing out? Uh, or, know, or the climate change, let's say. Yeah, so we, we don't really know. So the, the big thing that the, the engine that drives the weather in the North Coast is the, uh, this, this great big current of cold water that sits off the coast of California. It's called the Humboldt Current. And it, is, um, it drives all the sea life out there. It also is responsible for that fog and for the fact that, you know, Mark Twain said the coldest winter I ever spent was summer in San Francisco. It's that, yeah. that is... Um, 
and we don't know what, what climate, you know, global warming or climate change, whatever you want to call it, we don't know what it's going to do to that. We do know that as long as that weather sits out there um, and, and it comes in, like I said earlier, from, based on it it, it, it protrudes into the valleys of California based on how much heat is generated within those valleys. And almost every valley in California has a, has a, um, a lead, lead out into the coast. And so the closer you get to the coast, the cooler it is. We're seeing, I, I think it, at, when we're above the inversion layer of Montebello, I think we are getting a little bit warmer as compared to 30 years ago. Um, we're, we're certainly picking earlier our Cabernets. We, knock on wood, we haven't had a November harvest since um, here, since uh, finished. 2011. Oh, 2011. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And it used to be every third or fourth or fifth year yeah. we'd have a little bit. Um, uh, in Sonoma, it's it's a ho totally different story. I think it's got it's going to get a little bit cooler overall. But the other thing that we are definitely seeing, and this isn't just us, this is around the world, is that the uh, weather extremes are are happening more often. So when it gets hot, it gets really hot. When it if it's going to get wet, you know we get a you know lots of rain. It, it's it's um it's that's what I see more than anything. Exactly how it'll um, work here at Montebello, I think it's too, time Time will tell. Yeah. So one more question before we move on to the, the, the Montebello Chardonnay. And um, our neighbor, Mount Eden, they also make, I mean, I'm a big fan, they make a terrific mm -hmm. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir as well. How, how, how would you compare, Eric, our Chardonnay to, to Mount Eden style? Well, because we're higher up the mountain and we are on the limestone, I mean, that's definitely has an influence on the acidity of our wine. So our wine definitely has more of that juicy, you know, really lively acid on the palate, whereas the Mount Eden doesn't quite have the same level of acidity. Um, but they have beautiful fruit. I mean, they end up picking much earlier than us. I, I think they're usually like two weeks ahead of us um, so that they can get off the vine and, and have their alcohol levels low and, and also assure that they have good acid by picking early. Here we have the luxury of, you know, a much more moderate climate with much more ocean influence, slows the ripening process down and so we can pick by taste and, you know, get everything in. And even at full ripeness, I mean, we will still have, you know, pHs that are like 2.8. I mean, that's like approaching lemon juice. <laughs> so, <laughs> which I love. I mean, the more acidic, the better. Yeah, but we don't get that, that level of acid on every single parcel. So we usually have this nice range of pHs to work with so that the total blend, you know, it's, it's going to still end up being very acidic. And of course, you know, the big, biggest difference is the cooperage. I mean, Mount Eden is only French oak. Here we, we've really made the huge shift towards American oak. And so that gives our wine a, a different exotic spice and a little bit more texture that, that you can draw out of American oak, some of those complex carbohydrates that, that yeah. caramelize during barrel toasting. Yeah, excellent. All right, thanks, Eric. Yeah. And what, why don't we move to the 17 Montebello so there'll be a nice contrast to see the, you know, the, how, it, how it feels different on the palate. To me, that's always the huge difference between oh. the, the estate and the Montebello. So the Montebello is a little bit more linear not quite as broad on the palate, a little more focused, particularly in, in its youth like this, right? Yeah, uh, but for me, the nose, just the, the really strong kind of crushed rock limestone and a deeper array of fruit. There's much more dimension. It's not just this like citrus tone fruit. There's, there's a lot more going on here in the nose. Mm -hmm. And a bit of, of kind of what I, I find a, as an attractive element that we get from really long surly aging, where you get that yeasty, it's almost like a, a baked bread, a dessert. You know, it, it really, it just gives the wine, again, a whole nother uh, layer of, of aroma and, and more uh, body and viscosity on the palate. I know these wines age beautifully, particularly the Montebello Chardonnay. We'll see an example of that in a second. But mm -hmm. honestly, I love these wines in their youth. I think they're just tremendous to, uh, in their youth. I just love the flavor profile. Jo John, for, for you, from your perspective, trying the, the 17 Montebello, 
what kind of food variants would you recommend doing with a wine, a Chardonnay like this? Um, well, I mean, there's one, there's one thing I, I, I like quite a bit, whether it's white Burgundy or, or our Chardonnay, and I think they both work well with the similar foods. Um, you know, seafood is, is, is an easy go-to, but one of the things I really like um, are scallops. You know, you take mm -hmm. sea scallops mm -hmm. and you just, you know, sort of cook them a little bit, simmer them to get some of the juices out. And one of the things I like to do, um, you have friends coming over, you take that, you wrap it in a little bit of prosciutto, you put yeah. it on broil, it caramelizes, <laughs> oh, yeah. and that, <laughs> and a nice, nice <laughs> glass of Chardonnay, um, it's, it's pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's hard to hard to beat. Uh, I also and very, like to, and very simple too. Yeah, and I yeah. like to wrap wrap them in bacon. That's like a step above for sure. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're not doing me there. Yeah. No, I'm hungry now. That was that's good. I know. I know. <laughs> I was thinking that dish at, at the plume tours that we have every year. That that um, yes. kind of the la lobster bisque, or it's in that. It's, uh, it's like, like a souffle. The, it's a souffle with yeah. the, uh, the the crab. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh, that, that's awesome. But to me, that's a little richer. That actually goes better with the aged uh, Montebello. Shark. Yeah, yeah, probably the 2010. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you you talk, uh, Eric, about lees, and I think a lot of people don't always know what you mean when you refer to that. And what, what is that? And how does oh, that's that just all the all the yeast, all the solids, the original juice when we come out of the press has got a little bit of chunks of grape skin and, you know, pulp. So there's about 1% solid mixed in the juice that we mix up as we barrel down. So we're uniformly filling every barrel. And then as natural yeast that came in on, on the grapes in the juice begin to ferment, they create biomass. And so as they complete the fermentation, there's no more carbohydrate food source, they begin to die off and they, they kind of fall to the bottom of the barrel and they create this kind of a, well, I hate to use the word sludge, but you know, this yeah. thick layer at the bottom of the barrel. And, you know, we'll go through periodically every week, every you know, like two to three weeks and we'll, we'll uh, gently stir that up back into the wine what that's doing is as the yeast are breaking down they release some of the complex essential oils that are trapped within the cell structure so that kind of every stir you give the wine kind of adds some more body and richness to the the wine it also is, is kind of homogenizing the nutrients the micronutrients that are released from the dead yeast which the malolactic bacteria that are naturally occurring they they need to have some of those nutrients available so that they can do their job of completing the malolactic fermentation. So we're generally stirring from like January through like April, mm -hmm. uh, again, on that frequency of every two to three weeks. And a lot of that's decided by, by taste. So I'm in the cellar constantly tasting through the lots and deciding, do we stir or do we wait? And as we finish malolactic, then we, we stop stirring. We don't wanna introduce too much oxygen to the wine at that point, because then, you know, we don't have natural protection from oxidation, like a red wine, the pigment helps protect the wine from that. In Chardonnay, it would just begin to convert the flavors and, you know, you really start to see the, the wine kind of lose its freshness. So we'll stop stirring, we'll wait for all the lots to finish malolactic, we'll then go through and taste and then decide what barrels and what cubes go to what assemblage, rack off in summer, make the two assemblages, return the barrel, let those two wines age out, and then generally bottle the estate first, release it first. Montebello tends to have more time in barrel mm -hmm. and be bottled and then get a, a, at least a good year, year and a half of bottle age before it's ready for release. Okay. Yeah, I love the questions coming through because they always span the spectrum of, of everything. It's just, so yeah. so the, the question for you, John, is like, someone's noticed that we're all using different shapes oh. of glasses <laughs> for tasting the Chardonnay. Yeah. So what, what, in your opinion, what is the, the best for Chardonnay? What, not necessarily, you know, what brand, but what, what glass shape would you recommend? 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm using a glass that, that we use sort of regularly at, mm -hmm. at, at the winery, which I think is, is, is fine. It's, it's a, it's a sort of a, oh, yeah. a, a uniform, you know, uniform cup glass. Um, I prefer, um, and I just didn't have any tonight, but the, so for the way I describe them is that the, the kind of triangular shape where they come out. Uh, mm -hmm. very very quickly but then come into a fairly tight cup at the top for me I yeah, think that you like really one, yeah. you can really get the aromatics going with yeah. with uh, white wines and I which I think is you know essential especially with a wine like this that has so much aroma to to yeah. you know to offer um, that that's my preference and I don't my I personally don't really I, I think that keeping them at at something you know in this sort of size i think is also important um and that has something to do with temperature too when you get really large bowls um you know you're 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 giving up some of that nice coolness which i think is you know temperatures temperature is is, is important with all the wines i think it's it's particularly important with white wine uh, yeah. you know i think it really really shifts the whole uh experience and, and the way that the aromas and the flavors express themselves yeah i mean a lot of times you'll go to a nice restaurant and when you're drinking a nice burgundy they'll bring up the, what i call the balloons right mm -hmm. yeah the really and, broad and yeah. honestly that's not my favorite i you know, agree to me, to me the, you lose a lot of the aroma in that glass and it, right. it warms up quicker but I mean, right it's traditional it's, it, yeah some of them are almost as wide as your face and yeah. you know the aromas are going out sides of your ears <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah and and as a and as impressive as they may seem you know yeah. to be these huge fish bowls I, I i don't think that they're i don't think that they help i think they actually yeah. detract from the enjoyment absolutely mm -hmm. So yeah. David Gates, back to you, uh, a question about for our Chardonnays, uh, clones and rootstock, and, and obviously that's evolved mm -hmm. over the time from, from the 60s to, till today, but you know, what, what are we working with right now? Yes, um, the, original, the original, original grapes that were planted in the late 40s and then pulled out in the mid 80s, that was just kind of a generic California clone. Some of that is, um, what we ended up having um, at, at the uh, upper that Eric talked about that we, we butted over the high, high Mallet. That was a kind of core to their, um, to, to that sp specific uh, clone. But Chardonnay in California has a, um, a, a checkered past at, at best. Um, it's, it had, it was imported immediately, um, you know, in the 1880s, 1890s. And there were some serious efforts by a, a George, or no, was it George? Any Wetmore, who was the first agricultural commissioner in California, who sold a lot of his uh, land to the Wentes, who still farm there today. So those two names are intricately involved with Chardonnay. And in fact, the Wentes um, did their own importation of Chardonnay to work off of um, Wetmore's work. And then there's also Palmasan. So those are kind of the two areas where Chardonnay got into California. But Chardonnay was never that important in California unless you were making sparkling wine like, wine like Palmasan or you had a real passion for it, mainly because it was pretty lousy with virus. So it didn't give a lot of crop. People wanted, you know, growers wanted um, grapes with more crop and white wine was more like uh, French Columbard and Full Blanche and um, Palomino, things like that. So um, the UC Davis went on a, on a big... Um, work in, in progress led by Harold Olmo to develop some better Chardonnay clones. And they came up with uh, what is out in the industry as 108 or 03 or 08. There's all, these are all clone numbers, right? Um, and, they, and they basically heat treated them to clean them up. And so they had good yields and they made wines. Um, and we have some of that. It, that's all of, a, all of the uh, Chardonnay clones that we planted in the um, 80s and 90s are from, or is basically that because we went around, uh, this is before my time, went around and did some, um, some taste, tastings of Chardonnay in the mid 80s when they decided to pull out the old vines because um, they were just not very well or doing very well. And that was 
some of the best wines are made from those clones and they're great if you can control the, the crop load on them. Um, since then, we've gone back to um, the Mount Eden clone, which Paul Masson brought in. <clears throat> and that's been cleaned up and that was um, cleaned up with two different ways. And this is, um, this gets into the weeds a little bit, but it's really cool because it's, um, it shows you where, where, what you can do with viticulture and, and looking at how to do two different things. And what, one of them is to grow grapes for, or make clones for growers and, or make clones for wine quality. So mm -hmm. Mount Eden, uh, Mary Edwards, who's a famous, uh, very a pioneering woman winemaker, has her own winery now. I actually, they just sold it, but I was still involved with it. She was a winemaker at Mount Eden in the 70s, and she um, ended up taking two Davis, uh, the Mount Eden, two uh, vines from Mount Eden. And so they did, the, back then, the only way that they could clean up the virus, because it has a lot of virus, the only way they could clean the virus up was to heat treat it, which is what they had done in, uh, up until then. And those two clones are out in the industry, and nobody likes them. They are basically... They behave a lot like the um, the Wente clones of the, that we have out. Um, big yields, but not as much flavor as some of the Wente clones. So um, in the 90s, they developed a, a thing called micro shoot uh, propagation, tissue culture, basically. And that mm -hmm. eliminates the virus, but it has less of a, it does less of a change genetically to the grapevines. So the Mount Eden clone underwent that um, micro shoot uh, uh, tissue culture and that clone we love it and we're planting more of it and it makes great wine it's um mm -hmm. smaller not not huge yields uh, but just beautiful flavor beautiful fruit great really fruit. tiny clusters too tiny yes. berries tiny clusters really good flavor yep and so so that's so those are two um, clones that we use and um and then the the other ones that we have kind of looked at uh, are some on top so Antav is basically the, the UC Davis Foundation Plant Services of France, um, only bigger. And uh, they, they have uh, developed several different, um, you know, tranches, if you will, of, of uh, looking at all of their different varieties. And the, the couple that we have had are, are ones that have been around since the 90s, and that's uh, 95 and 96. And we like it. I think it's... Um, it's, it's lacking a little bit in acidity, but that means we can pick it a little bit younger, or I'm sorry, a little bit less ripe. So we For can- For sure. Yeah, sure. we have to, yeah. Yep, otherwise yeah. it loses its acid. So, yeah. so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. And uh, we like the old Wente and- which Yeah, is, which I was gonna say, the 17 is purely that, the old yep. Wente from the yep, organic block at Rooston. Awesome. So that's why there's so little of it because I mean we narrowed it down I mean of all the lots that we tasted through in the cellar in 17 vintage that was the one that had mm -hmm. the most incredible flavor acidity lower alcohol as well so it Ooh. made a beautiful old one t selection awesome so Eric we have a question I mean uh, it, you know it's a sad story but some of the top producers in burgundy white burgundy in particular mm -hmm. yeah you know suffered through several years of uh, their wines um, going through premature oxidation. Um, so the question is, have we experienced any of that? And, and uh, if not, why? And what, what do you think accounted Ooh, for? I think we've, yeah, we've been very fortunate to not experience that at all. I think uh, the main culprit has not necessarily been their winemaking. You know, making wines in a very reductive way is, is, a, is a good way to prevent a lot of the oxidation from a, from even starting, uh, you know, ultimately what you've found with Premox is at the time of bottling, you know, they're filling bottles into cases and later on, you can be pulling those bottles out of that same case, all filled right at the same time. You're gonna find bottles that are just stunning, beautifully fresh, and then other bottles that have totally faded. I think it really comes down to the, the closures you know, the, the closures that they've used yeah. over, over time, they, they've, they've tended to prefer the corks that have been fully bleached, you know, where, where they're using peroxide, hydrogen peroxide to do the bleaching process. And what I've noticed, I mean, because we, we taste every cork batch that comes in as samples from our suppliers, you know, they, they don't always get all the peroxide out. And so if you've got just a trace amount in the cork, 
that's enough to just rapidly oxidize the wine in the bottle. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen it just when I've done my own, you know, tastings here with lots coming in, you know, we'll take samples, put them into a jar, fill them up with Chardonnay the next day, you know, pour off and taste. And where that batch of corks had peroxide still bound in the cork tissue, you see it in the Chardonnay. I mean, it would just be brown and just totally undrinkable. So yeah. I, I'm pretty convinced that, that it is the cork that has led to this terrible issue. We've avoided it because we've always really tended to go towards the more natural wash cork where it's very lightly washed with peroxide or no peroxide at all. So it's yeah. a very natural looking cork. David, back to you for a question. Uh, for several years, uh, in, over the last decade or so, we made a Michelaco Chardonnay, which uh -huh, has yeah. uh, vanished from the scene. Can you maybe comment on what, what's gone on with that vineyard? Yeah, one of, one of the sad, sad things um, of where we are growing our Chardonnay is it's kind of in the sweet spot for this very pernicious disease called Pierce's disease, mm -hmm. inspected by a leafhopper. And it is a bacterial disease that, that basically infects the vines and uh, plugs up their water conducting vessels and, and kills them. And that's what happened to the Michalaco vineyard. It was a small little vineyard. And um, when, when, the, when the disease got there, the insects just carried it over and it, it doesn't show up the first year. It usually takes about three years to, to show symptoms on the vines. And by then, basically the whole vineyard was infected. And so we lost it. Okay. Uh, we're talking about replanting it though. Okay, mm. good. Yeah. So let, let's move forward to uh, the last wine, the library wine, the 2010 Montebello. This oh, super cool vintage. I mean, we talked about 11, yeah. really cool, but 10 was also a cool vintage. This, uh, we didn't finish picking Chardonnay David Gates until October in 2010. So that's, yeah. a, that's a late year for a Chardonnay. Um, yes. So, um, that was also a really difficult year, John, only for Zinfandel, if I remember. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it certainly year. was. Yeah, for a different reason. <laughs> yeah, now. I mean, uh. 2010 was, was the year of, 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 of start and stop. In other words, it was a year where the, uh, we, we had a fairly cool summer. People started to pull leaves to try to get more sunlight in. Um, and the belief in general, I think, was that that, is the way that the rest of the season was going to um, was going to carry on, and then I think it was uh, David can correct me, but I think it was as late as um, first week of August we suddenly got some of the hottest days that we'd ever seen, um, but for you know like a three four day uh, continued over three or four days. So it really, you know, the vines, grapevines don't really like extremes. They like subtle change. They like dappled sunlight. Um, and they got this extreme heat that really, uh, it damaged a lot of fruit that had to be dropped. Um, I mean, we were able to make some successful wines, but I think it was one of the shortest crops uh, as, yeah. as a result of that that we've seen in the last 20 years, probably. Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. I still remember that vividly. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe you want to talk about the flavor development here, because I think a lot of people, you know, aren't used to trying our aged Chardonnay. So what, what, mm -hmm. happens, what happens over time and what, what, what type of flavors develop? Well, you know, what I see is that you get a little bit of kind of like a chestnut nuttiness that's really sweet, exotic. Um, you know, it goes from the primary fruits that are citrus and, and kind of tropical pineapple, apricots, to then more of a baked, you know, like a, a, a braised pear, a, a pear tart. I mean, it's more of a baked dessert element where it's, it's got that sweetness of, you know, the, the fruit that, you know, and the caramelization of, of the oak and yeah, it's more, much more subtle. There's even more of the, the limestone and there's even some salinity coming through from, yeah. you know, the, the fog that carries the, the sea salt to the vineyard and the minerals that come up from the soil. So it's much more pronounced. I mean, you get a lot more uh, of this really deeper layered 
fruit and uh, minerality. And what, what makes uh, the Montebello Chard able to age like this? I, I would say the majority of Chardonnay in California doesn't have this type of ageability. What, what allows this wine to develop over time? Well, it's a high acid for sure. I mean, that's, that's kind of the hallmark of, of what really protects the wine. The next thing is really just the gentle handling that we do in the winery. I mean, it's all whole cluster press. We're not beating the fruit up and, and like trying to press out every drop. I mean, it's a very gentle process of receiving the grapes and, and extracting the juice, barreling it down. And, and really we're relying on, on mostly just not moving the wine for a very long time. We'll do maybe two racks off the lee before bottling but then the wine doesn't go through a filter. So, so we're really keeping the wine untouched, unprocessed. So we're carrying along all the wonderful flavor and, and, and giving the wine a greater aging potential just by not, not processing it in any heavy way. Yeah. So since we're trying the 2017 side by side with the 10, yeah. people are interested to know, you know which of these is the better vintage and which ah. are, <laughs> and how would you compare and contrast these two wines? Because well, two, two different really wines. great years. I mean, lots of rainfall in the winters. Um, I tend to, to, I'm more drawn towards those challenging years on Montebello where it's really tough to ripen Cabernet. That sometimes will make some of our best Chardonnay, like 10 and 11, you know, which were really tough on Cab were like the perfect conditions for Chardonnay, uh, of just allowing longer hang time, more flavor intensity to develop in the berries. Um, the fruit, yeah, wasn't necessarily pretty looking when it came in, you know, but, but when pressed off, that juice just had all the wonderful elements to make great wine. Um, but 17 also, I mean, that was a great year, but it was a, a much hotter summer. Yeah. We didn't have any mildew pressure. We just had a lot of rain that winter. So there was a lot of water available to the vine. But it's a very different growing condition that year. But the particular spot of the mountain that made the 17 Montebello, that to me, with, especially with the old Wente clone, I think has really given us something really wonderful to work with. So, you know, I have a question. One, one thing for me that I see in this, um, in the 2010 Montebello, is there's this grippiness to it. So that, that it tannins, and I don't know if that's just because the primary fruit has subsided and you can see that more. It still has the same amount of acidity, but there's this really nice refreshing grippiness that, that it would yeah. go really well with some rich food like we were talking about and getting me hungry about uh, earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, is that would, yeah. would that is that is that fair to say that it's like tannin, a tannin grip? It feels like tannin. Like yeah. you can imagine if you had a dark glass and you're just blind tasting that that you were tasting maybe a, a red wine with some some grip to it. Um, but it, you know, I I think you know it's what comes in on the grapes. There's flavanols. There's different compounds that are in the the skin. In a tougher growing condition. Certainly when, when you have a cooler growing season, you're going to have thicker skins. You're going to have a lot more vanilla content bound up and we're pressing that into the juice. So that, that goes to the wine and it's going to be part of the composition, giving the wine texture, flavor, and, and that kind of astringency in the finish. So David Gates, what about a food pairing for you with the 2010? You were talking about richer food. What, what would you have in mind? <laughs> I, you know, um, for me, it would be it would be some kind of really uh, rich. Uh, well, I love um, you know Chiapino, and I think mm -hmm. this would be really really good with with Chiapino, especially with some nice, um, really really thick, beautiful, really good French bread that I can't seem to find here. You have to find it <laughs> just go in. Um, yeah. Toasted really well, and then let the kind of let it melt in with all the all the sauce. But yeah, that that would be great. That's an easy yeah. answer. Chipino goes with everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah <it does. laughs> what can I say? <laughs> so here's another. It was a viticultural question, more up your alley, David. In that, um, you know, obviously with our our old vines, infidels, you know, we you know you see that you see a, in, 
uh, a change in quality as the vines get older. Why don't we do that? see that with white wines? You don't really see old vine white wines. Any ideas why, why that isn't, is the case? Well, I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier with the, with the amount of the grapes that were planted um, when the partners bought um, Ridge planted in the 40s. So anything, anything planted in the, um, before the 1960s of Chardonnay had a lot of virus. So <clears throat> that's mostly leaf roll virus. And <clears throat> excuse me, what that does is it, it changes the physiology physiology of the vines and it, it adds more malic acid to the to the grapes but it also is a debilitating virus so over time it, they just get weaker and weaker and, and so yields get less and that's why Chardonnay wasn't popular you know after in early California viticultural or even after prohibition it just not enough yield um, mm -hmm. the Grape, the Chardonnay grapes can age uh, really well. They're not that susceptible to wood disease. So they, once you, if you get them in the right spot and you take good care of them, they will reward you for many years. And you're starting to see that now. So again, most of the Chardonnay planted in the 60s and 70s, and even in the 80s was cone 108, if it was what I always call it. Um, and that one, you just, ha you have to really watch the yields on. And be careful with that. But then you, you have to remember um, where most of the Chardonnay is grown is still in the, in the you know, Central Valley, the Big Valley, um, it, if you're talking all of California. And so those grapes are, they're not, they're, they're not biennial crops, but they're certainly not what we would call uh, perennial crops in the North <laughs> Coast. If they, if they go 15 years, that's great, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 and then what happened in Napa was a lot of the vines planted in the 70s and 80s were on a rootstock that AXR that was um, supposedly resistant to Flaxor, but the Flaxor mutated and uh, attacked it and there was a massive replanting. And then the massive replanting had some virus issues. So now there's been another massive replanting. So it's hard to find older uh, vine Chardonnay uh, out there. Yeah. There are some vines but not too many, not very so, many. So John, what if, I mean, if we're talking about growing for quality and, and Burgundy is sort of like the pinnacle of that, I mean, what do we see there? Do you see the, the, the vignerons, the growers, um, rotating their, their Chardonnay frequently or, are they, or do they let it stay in the ground for extended periods of time for, for decades? Well, um... You know, it's it, it, it's a different, it's a very different situation over there because most of the people who are growing Chardonnay, uh, as we know it, you know, from most, almost all from Burgundy, um, and keep in mind that they're they're restricted by law to what they can plant in a given place if they're going to call it Burgundy. So Chardonnay is pretty much their only option, and the the the, the vineyard plots at Burgundy, and it's so unique compared to the rest of the world. Um, are so small that, you know, even just from the economics standpoints, I mean, if, if, if all you have is 10 rows of Chardonnay, you're gonna leave it in the ground and, 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 and wanna keep it going as long as you can. So, you know, there's, there's very much a, um, you know, they're, they're, they're reluctant, you know, to be pulling out, pulling out vines. So they'll they'll let it stay in for for decades then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And do you especially think that has getting, to, I'm sorry, Eric. Go ahead. Uh, especially if they're getting three hundred to you know five hundred dollars <laughs> a bottle. I mean, <laughs> you, well, yeah, they have. You to. don't want to <laughs> rip it out anytime soon. Yeah, but I, I would imagine that has an appreciable impact on the quality too, the age of the vine. I mean, then it's. You know, you're, you, they're not growing for volume so much. They're no, abs no, there's no question about it. I mean, I think that, um, you know, you, you, we could have an entire, we could have a whole separate, um, you know, uh, tasting revolving around the, the hierarchy of what really makes, uh, you know, in terms of grape growing, what makes wine great. And um, you have the age of the vine. You have, David's talked quite a bit about the clone, you have the soil, you have the microclimate, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think that the age of the vine is, um, 
is a key factor, but you know, you can have 150 year old grapes and vines, but if they're growing in the place that really isn't quite the mi right microclimate and the clone isn't the great, the greatest choice, you know, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really make that big a difference. So John, I'm going to throw two questions at you at the same time. And I think it okay. might, might be the same answer. Okay. So one question is <laughs> which, which uh, Ridge Chardonnay would you select if you're trying to change, turn a friend onto it who loves Pinot Grigio? And the other, <laughs> and the other question is, do you think much about expanding your white offerings is the second question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, wow. I mean, <laughs> Chardonnay and Pinot Grigio, uh, th th those are, um, yeah, I, I think that I would, I would say this, um, if you're trying to move someone um, who uh, maybe is focused a lot on, on drinking just Pinot Grigio over to something like a red Chardonnay, I would probably start with a younger one because I think that that, that would be um, mm -hmm. a, an easier transition. Uh, <laughs> and uh, well, and, and as far as other wines, I mean, we, we actually are um, uh, just in the last two vintages, we've started expanding our white wine program. Um, Eric is making um, a number of uh, white Rhone wines mm -hmm. that um, have been very, very well received. I'm making a small amount of uh, an Italian grape varietal from uh, Southern Italy, um, but not sourced from Southern Italy, that's where the grape comes from, <laughs> sourced from Mendocino <laughs> County, uh, uh, called Falangina. And so yes, the answer is yes, we are, we are starting to um, expand the horizons a bit in our white wine uh, portfolio. And I, I would also say that if you're trying to turn somebody onto a ridge white wine, me, who likes being a Grigio, I would say either the Palangina or the Grenache Blanc would probably be good bets to, to move people. Um, yeah. a very good, very good point. Yep. Yeah. And David, uh, we're sourcing all these, uh, for the most part, yeah, all of the, the white rooms from the Adelaide Hills region uh, of Paso Robles, the ABA there. Uh, and someone was asking about Chardonnay in that region. And I'm, I'm not aware of Chardonnay planted there, but it may be, hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, there is. And in, in fact, Adelaide makes a beautiful Chardonnay with some um, okay. vines that are about 12 to 15 years old. They also have one of the older Pinot Noir vineyards in California hmm. uh, growing up in those hills. So, and there are a couple others. Halter Ranch has a Chardonnay and, um, uh, I don't know if Tablas Creek still has some Chardonnay mm -hmm. that they had planted, but um, I, do they call it, that's not what they call antithesis, but they call it something of great name. <laughs> but I think it's out of the ground now, um, but they, they, had, yeah. they had done it as, um, as a nod to one of their um, minority partners to, to grow a little bit of it. So there mm -hmm. is some Chardonnay out there. It's a, it's a great spot and that's um, very much limestone hills and it's, uh, it's, it's mostly hills. Um, so yeah, um, it's a, it's a, seems to be a great area, but you know, that's pa Paso, to say Paso Robles, that you span from, you know, region one almost to region five, it's a huge AVA. And now yeah. that they've broken it up into the sub AVAs, it's, um, it's, it's kind of fun. It's a, it's a great place to explore. Awesome. Well, we're come to five o'clock Pacific time. So we're, um, filled our hour. Any, any last thoughts on the 2010 Montebello uh, before uh, we, we sign off here? Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I really <laughs> love how it's showing. But yeah, and I could probably imagine it still going another 15 years. I mean, the great thing is you, know, you still pop corks on like some of the last vintages of Montebello that were bottled in the 80s from the original vine. You know, the 85, you could still drink today. And, and, you know, I think with what we've got going on now with m having planted in a, a much more diverse way, we've got the clonal diversity, the elevational div diversity, you know, we, we're on the kind of north facing slope. So we've really got kind of the best spots on the mountain covered with Chardonnay and, yeah. you know, it's fun to be working with. And um, I love, I love our Chardonnay. It's really, I, I don't drink 
too many other Chardonnays besides our own. Well, good. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, John. Thank you, David. Thank you, Eric, for your time today. It was a great session. Really enjoyed the wines and the conversation. A big thanks to our audience uh, for joining us today. Um, We don't have a roundtable planned for next week. We're kind of in a brainstorming mode. We're going to try to come up with some interesting new ideas, and hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll be back at you with some uh, new tastings, with some new formats and some new ideas. But uh, It's been great. I think this is our eighth or ninth of these, and they've all been absolutely fabulous. So thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to communicating with you again soon in the the near future. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. 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 Cheers.